This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I'm going to show you how I made this revolving shoe rack for dolls for my niece last Christmas. It wouldn't have to be just a shoe rack for dolls. You could just make it a little bit larger and do a normal shoe rack for you, your girlfriend, your wife, whichever you want. And you can see here I'm just cutting a bunch of squares. The squares don't have to be uh, super exact. Uh, since the circles we're going to be cutting out of these are going to be a little bit smaller, but I am just marking the center and that way everything will be nice and consistent. There are a lot of YouTube videos out there about how to make a circular cutting jig for your bandsaw, so I won't make this video about that, but I am cutting, I think it was 17 inch circles out of these squares here, and it was a really simple jig, it only took me about five minutes to make. For this jig though, if you're curious, I just cut the end off a nail inserted in a hole in that little sled you see underneath and then drilled a tiny hole in the plywood and then it just rotates around that little nail head. So pretty simple, but yeah, check out some other YouTube videos if you want a full video on that. And don't be too intimidated. If you have a bandsaw, you definitely should make this jig for yourself. It really did take just a few minutes. Um, and then I ended up cutting out, I can't remember how many was in this total, but just a whole pile of these round circular pieces. If you don't want to do a bandsaw jig or you don't have a bandsaw, you can actually buy round pieces from Home Depot in different types. I wanted to do plywood because I think it'd be a little bit stronger and wouldn't uh, flex as much or wouldn't have to worry about the wood movement as much as doing solid wood. But Home Depot and some other places do sell just round discs like a craft store like Joanne Fabric. So feel free to go that route if you'd rather. After I got all the pieces, I just did a real rough sanding with my Festool sander here. It had a kind of a soft edge on it, and that was nice for those corners. But you can still see there's a lot of pits. You see the layers between the plywood. So what I'm going to use here is Automotive Bondo to uh, smooth those out. I've used this quite a bit with wood before if you're going to paint it, and it works really well. Um, you got to work pretty quick, mix the right amount in there, and you only have a couple minutes to work. The stuff's pretty cheap, so if it hardens up, just mix up a new batch, and it goes pretty easy. There's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do this. I started doing this smearing it in with like a Bondo trowel and then I ended up just using some nitrile gloves and wiping it in with my hands because it seemed to get into those cracks a little bit better. The Bondo is ready to sand in just a couple hours. Um, sand's really nice. I'm not going crazy with it. It is going to be a paint finish so it doesn't have to be as perfect as the, most of the furniture that I make. But just get it nice and smooth. I decided to go with a, just a regular paint grade white pine uh, from Home Depot for this build. And I did two shorter strips and one longer strip. So when I fasten them all together, they make uh, four equal lengths, if that makes sense. And you'll see here in a second if it doesn't. For the ends of the dividers, I'm just doing a little chamfer on here. Uh, not for any particular reason other than I just kind of like the look. And it'll look a little bit more finished than squared off. I mentioned earlier this is for my niece. Uh, she's nine years old and she's about as aggressive as her pet hamster. So this won't get a lot of wear and tear. So I'm not doing any domino joinery or dowels or even screws. You can see I'm just using wood glue and finish nails there. Uh, so it'll be pretty light duty, but kids like to grow out of things too. So I didn't want to put a ton of time into the joinery if this isn't something she's going to keep forever. If you are doing this for a client or a high traffic area, teenage boys or something, then yeah, I'd probably add some screws and or dowels or dominoes for a project like this. Not to say that this wood glue with clamps isn't going to be strong enough. Uh, you could probably throw it down a flight of stairs and it would hold up. Uh, I tend to overbuild things, so that's why I'm kind of explaining myself here. But what I'm doing is just each layer I'm adding one more tier, kind of like a little wedding cake here, clamping it down, leaving it overnight, and then adding another layer. So it was kind of time consuming, but uh, I think it'll be strong enough in the end. You can see there just a nice squeeze out of the glue, kind of a normal amount. And the cool thing about this design is you could go as high as you wanted. You could do this six feet high or eight feet high if you had a big closet. Uh, this is just for her doll shoes, so I think I ended up going about four feet tall in the end. There were a couple odd clamping angles you can see there. I had to kind of toe one in. But overall, as long as you get the squeeze out, it should be a really good bond between those layers of wood and plywood. For the top of the wedding cake, I decided to add this little box here for any type of taller shoes or taller toys that she may end up wanting to put on there since the other part was kind of a sm shorter gap. So this is uh, why this top tier looks a little different than the rest. I did spend a little more time than I'm showing here on getting it perfectly centered in the middle of these. Because when this spins, if it's not perfectly centered, it'll look all wobbly like an out-of-balance wheel. So make sure you get it right in the center. 
Once it was all drying together, I gave it uh, one more hand sanding before I go on to the etch primer that I'll show you here in just a second. If you're like me and you like to spray paint, you got to use this etch primer. Uh, it's available at most auto stores. A friend of mine paints cars and they use this stuff in uh, door jams and things before they do their regular primer. Really does a nice job of filling in the kind of heavy pits and gaps. So it leaves almost like a rubbery finish when it's done, but makes an excellent surface to prep for paint. And anytime you're spray painting, just give it a real light dusting to start. Let it dry, come back, give it a little bit heavier coat. You can see here we got a pretty heavy coat and how smooth the edge primer made it. And this is before any sanding. So I'll be giving it a light sanding before we go on to painting it. And even though I'm priming it with spray paint, we're not gonna spray paint it in the end. What we're gonna do is we're gonna brush on the paint that ends up looking like a sprayed on finish. The paint that I'm using is called Benjamin Moore Advanced Paint and it's a water-based paint that ends up uh, drying looks just like an oil-based paint, which is really cool because oil-based paints are a pain to work with and the water base isn't. So it gives a brush-free, almost a, I won't say a perfect finish, but as close to a sprayed on finish as you're gonna get with a brush. It's pretty cool in the end. And like with any paint project, you can go fairly light on the first pass and then come back, sand it, do a little bit heavier pass, and that's going to give you the best finish in the end. I had the hardest time keeping my brushes clean for, you know, after you use them 10, 20 times, it seemed like they always got gunked up until I got this little tool from Benjamin Moore. It costs like two bucks. I'm sure you can get them on Amazon too. But use this, get your brush perfectly clean, and it'll last actually forever. The key to getting a perfect finish with this Benjamin Moore paint is letting it settle, letting it sit flat. So you'll be really tempted to keep brushing at it and trying to make it perfect, but you're best off if you can just get it on there so it's all covered and then just walk away. So that's why I'm painting each layer as it lays kind of right side up so it'll level itself out. And another little tip, which you're gonna think I'm crazy, is you can add a splash of water to it, which will make it a little bit thinner, but it'll actually make it kind of level itself out even more and that'll give you the best finish. You can see it's starting to look pretty good here. You can spend as much time on this as you want as you know how much sanding because you'll still see some brush strokes if you really get in there. But um, I didn't go crazy, but I wanted it to be pretty nice. Anything with my name attached to it, I'm kind of kind of particular about. But I sanded it up, coming back with one final coat here. And again, really try to let it level itself out and hope, for, hope I get the best finish in the end. Only on the last coat, I went and got some little art brushes from, I can't remember, the Joanne Fabrics or the art store, and came and hit all the edges with just those really fine brushes, and that gave a pretty good finish on the edge. For the revolving mechanism, I went to Woodcraft, and they have actually a surprising amount of Lazy Susans you can get. Uh, this was, I think, like six bucks or eight bucks or something, uh, shockingly cheap for kind of a cool little mechanism, but uh, you can see here, I'm, this is the very bottom plate, and I'm marking my holes to drill here. And it's kind of an interesting way to mount this. I hope I can explain it well enough in the end here. So I'm marking my mounting holes and plus one visual hole. And that visual hole is going to be how you attach it to the whole uh, shoe rack itself. So all these holes here is just to get it mounted. And then you'll see the larger hole that I'm drilling, and that's going to be able to peep through so you can see through to mount it to the main shoe rack piece. And there I'm just cutting through the other side so I didn't blow it out at all. So as you can see here, I'm just lining up those holes, screwing them down with some button head screws. Nice and snug. And it'll make sense here in a second when I give kind of an awkward camera angle. When you look through there, you can see this holes that you want to screw in to attach it to the main base. So you just keep spinning that around until you line up the holes to mount to the uh, main body. And there you go. The main test, of course, is to see if it revolves without looking like a caveman wheelbarrow and spins pretty nice. So all in all, pretty happy with that. If I didn't do a very good job explaining how this was gonna be a shoe rack or you had a hard time visualizing what it was gonna look like in the end, I asked my sister to send me a few pics of it in its uh, final resting place. This uh, was after about six months of use, so you can see that my niece is pretty gentle on these things. Uh, obviously a little small for normal shoes. If you did want to make a similar shoe rack, you could just expand the distance between the levels, and uh, I think it'd be kind of cool to do one, you know, maybe four, six, even eight feet tall in a big closet. 
And before you go, I wanted to thank this video's sponsor, Squarespace. I recently did the math and it takes about three times as long to film one of these projects, edit it, upload it as it does just to make the project. So I wouldn't be able to make these videos if it wasn't for sponsors like Squarespace. So thanks so much to them. And while I've been sponsored by Squarespace for a couple months now, I've actually been using them for over three years. When I first got into trying to make my own website, it was really intimidating. So what I did is I went and looked at a ton of other makers' websites and I found a couple that I really liked. So all I did was browse through Squarespace's modern templates, found one that looked really similar to the one I liked. It might actually be the same one as the one that I found. Uploaded everything. It was really plug and play, super easy. And that template is called Montauk. So if you want to copy me, by all means, I did it to someone else. So help yourself. And thanks so much to them for providing such easy to use modern templates. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to DIY your own website, go to squarespace.com forward slash Blacktail Studio to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much. Okay, that's the whole video. I really appreciate you making it this far. If I left anything out, please don't hesitate to ask in the comments. I'm really pretty good about responding to most every question in there. Or if you just have some advice about how I could do this a little bit better, I always appreciate good advice. So thanks again for watching and thanks for the comments.